What happened? The colony was in good shape just a few months ago. What did John Smith do? Why is Ratcliffe in charge? Where's Wingfield? These men look terrible. Where are the rest of them? Where's Gosnold? Just what is going on here? Someone better have an explanation. All of these questions, and certainly more, must have been running through Christopher Newport's mind as he returned to Virginia for the first resupply mission on January 2, 1608. He had many reasons to wonder. The colony was in severe distress. Only 38 of the original 105 settlers were still alive, and few of those remaining got along. Wingfield, the leader in June, was languishing in prison. So too was the newly freed from captivity John Smith. Carry me back to old Virginia. Newport was head of a small, two-ship resupply mission that had brought 120 new settlers as well as fresh provisions. But the supplies were not enough for the 158 men. They weren't supposed to be but that wasn't the immediate concern. The settlers were not excited about Smith's return from captivity. They blamed him for Thomas Emery and Jehu Robinson's deaths. A hasty trial was conducted, Smith was found guilty, and he was to be hung. That was the scene Newport and his men first saw upon arrival. Newport would hear none of it. Leviticus 24's eye for an eye statute did not apply here. Smith didn't kill the men, Indians did. Thus Newport saved Smith's neck a second time. And not only was Smith freed, but he was also elevated back to his leadership role. But he did have a demotion in that he was removed from the Cape Merchant position. Newport needed Smith. Perhaps they both knew it, as both would be dead without each other. Newport's stress still remained from his return home over the summer of 1607. He needed to find proof of something valuable to show the colony's leaders back home, or don't come back. He must have believed that he did find gold on the first trip, because he plunged headlong into obtaining more sparkly dirt by commissioning John Martin to find a good sample. As Martin prepared to find the precious metal, however, Newport realized that Jamestown's initial structures would not shelter the new arrivals. Thus, new houses, a storehouse, a church, and other structures were built or reinforced, apparently, quote, cheerfully and in haste, according to Wingfield's account. But before too much enjoyment could be had, a new settler had accidentally set his house ablaze on January 7th. The fire spread quickly from house to house, and then to the storehouse, church, and fort walls. The colonists toiled to quench the conflagration, but their attempt was futile. After all, they built their houses with thatched roofs. Only three houses survived the fire. Everything else, food, provisions, protection, was lost. In an effort to illustrate the newly brokered friendship between the Powhatans and the English, Powhatans sent aid to the struggling settlers along with Pocahontas. But though those provisions were timely, many still died because of the extreme cold that had set in during January 1608. Historians have termed the historical period during which Jamestown was founded the Little Ice Age. It had far-reaching effects plaguing much of the Northern Hemisphere from as early as 1200 AD and lasted to perhaps the beginning of the 20th century. Jamestown, as with the Continental Army under George Washington and the French Third Estate on the eve of the Bastille, suffered mightily under icy skies from this period. But for our purposes, how did the Little Ice Age affect the colonists and Indians? For starters, the exposed colonists had to restart their shelter work. Then they had to think about food, since the storehouse was lost. This is where Powhatan stepped in, but he could only provide so much because of the poor growing season that his tribes had just endured. They could dig for local roots, but then the cold became an issue once again. In spite of all that, Powhatan continued to send provisions to the English through Pocahontas every four to five days, while also sending many invitations for Newport to visit Werowocomico. Eventually, after a few weeks, Newport decided to accept the invitation. Yet John Smith was wary about the invite. After all, he had been relating his captivity stories while trying to stay warm around campfires. Maybe he'd be found a liar. More importantly, Smith was worried that the invite might be a trap. That being the case, when Newport, Smith, 
and newly arrived Matthew Scrivener, who was elevated to Smith's now relinquished Cape Merchant position, and 40 other armed men, as well as a Greyhound, set off for Powhatan's capital. Smith moved ahead of Newport's group as quickly as possible. They sailed together down the James to Point Comfort, and then moved up the Pamunkey River past Tyndall's Point, so named for the colony's pilot, Robert Tyndall, where Smith and 20 men separated from Newport in order to figure out whether or not the Powhatans could be trusted. Tyndall guided the shallop toward Powhatan's capital, but he took the wrong route, and the boat became lodged in a reedy swamp. At that moment, one of Powhatan's sons, Nantiquad, called out to Smith. Smith decided to answer the call by disembarking in the frigid mud and wade to dry land. Soon after coming ashore, 200 native warriors greeted the 20 settlers and led the way, because Smith wanted them to lead in order to make sure the path was safe, to where Wacomico. After this short march, Smith and his men arrived at a feast with a full party atmosphere, a sharp contrast to what he had previously experienced. Beautiful women, many warriors, and a lot of food were present. But though Powhatan was happy to see Smith again, he wanted to see Newport, Smith's, quote, father, as Powhatan called him. The party quickly took on a chilly element when Powhatan then brought up the trick that Smith had played in giving the Indians the burdensome cannons. Powhatan reiterated his request for English weapons, but the next time, offer something more transportable. On that note, Powhatan then asked why the English were still sporting their arms. They should lay them at Powhatan's feet as a gesture of trusting submission like the rest of his Indian subjects. Smith would have none of it, replying that, quote, was a ceremony our enemies desired, but never our friends. An interesting historical jab at gun control advocates, perhaps. Smith then attempted to jump into court negotiations, but Powhatan deflected the request, saying that he would fulfill his promise, but only as a present to Newport. Where was he again? Oh yes, he'd be there the next day. Until then, Smith and Powhatan settled into evening-long repartee as both men played the diplomatic game. When the time came for Smith to leave for the evening, he returned to his run-aground shallop. Rain began falling to add to the misery, and Smith had no choice but to accept Powhatan's hospitality for the night. Newport did indeed arrive the next morning, at which point the feast began once again, and lasted four more days. Now it was Newport's turn to play the power game. He offered Thomas Savage, a teenage boy, in a cultural exchange of sorts to Powhatan, who in turn responded by offering Namontak in return. Both Savage and Namontak would play key roles in Virginia's story, but more on them throughout the series. For now, their marching orders were to learn the language and culture of their respective people groups. Then Powhatan got down to the business that the English had in mind. Trade, food, survival. Powhatan offered to supply food, but wasn't certain that the English had anything he and his people really valued. He wanted to see what the English had to offer, and he'd take what he thought worthwhile. Smith, near Newport throughout this mission, quickly raised an alarm. He told Newport that Powhatan wanted to see everything the English had and then cheat them. Smith had become acquainted with this trick during his previous trade dealings. But Newport didn't care. He still thought that the Powhatans were savages. Savages that could be outwitted by civilized English intelligence. Thus, Smith sat by and raged as the Powhatans took advantage of Newport's pride. Smith later said that four bushels of corn were given in exchange for what should have purchased 20 hogsheads. He couldn't sit by any longer. Smith coyly introduced the game-changing, trade-fixing blue beads to clean up Newport's gaff. Now the English began tricking the Indians. Blue beads were just as worthless in England as any other prizes being offered. But for the Powhatans, the blue jewels were priceless. Accordingly, Powhatan had to have the beads, so he offered 250 bushels of corn more in order to obtain them. After trade was complete for the time being, Newport then offered to create an alliance with the Powhatans against their enemies, the Monacans, especially because Newport wanted to know more about the route to the South Sea. No final agreement was made, and the English were off once again. This time, they journeyed to Opecancano's village to trade for more food. But not before Smith once again lodged his vessel in the mud. A half dozen Powhatans ran out into the mud and carried Smith to safety, embarrassingly for Smith. <laughs> 
Overall, however, the English were satisfied and eventually made their way back to Jamestown in March after digging a rock they hoped would be a copper mine. Smith believed that he had secured 12 weeks' worth of provisions, but upon arrival he and Newport discovered that reality was much more serious than they could comprehend. They arrived back at Jamestown on March 9th, and Newport saw that the conditions had worsened. The buildings were still in disrepair, food was scarce, except for the provisions brought on the resupply mission, but those provisions were being sold to the settlers at inflated costs by the mission sailors. Smith at one point tells us that what used to be purchased for one ounce of copper was now being sold for one pound. Such conditions more than decimated the ranks. From the time Newport returned in January to April, about 14 weeks had elapsed, and half of the men alive in January were now dead, according to John Smith. One key issue, as John Smith saw it, was the desire to find gold. The demand for the metal was so strong that men would rather dig, wash, and refine the material than provide for their own sustenance or shelter. No fort was built, no homes either. Further, no crops were sown, which would ensure longer-term disaster. But the men filled Newport's flagship, the John and Francis, full of what they hoped was mounds of gold ore. Newport then joined the sparkly dirt, along with his mariners, as well as the deposed Edward Maria Wingfield, Gabriel Archer, and the Powhatan Exchange, Namontak. It was to be a glorious return for Newport, or so he hoped, and John Smith was nervous. He had reason to be, because Wingfield and Archer would sully his name in London. To counter this from happening, Smith wrote his first Jamestown record, a true relation, for the short title, and would send it with Captain Francis Nelson after he miraculously arrived a few days later. Smith had hoped that the gold fever plaguing the remaining colonists after Newport's April 10th departure would assuage, but it didn't. It got worse. John Martin, who had an extensive background and connections in London's goldsmithing trade, pushed the colonists to keep searching. Smith, along with Scrivener, pushed back by organizing the remaining colonists into labor units. They set about rebuilding the fort's walls while also planting corn, as well as repairing the church and storehouse. But as the remaining men started into their work, an alarm rang out. A ship was spotted. A tense standoff lasted a few minutes as the colonists fearfully looked to see if the approaching ship was Spanish. If it were, then a fight that the English could not win was about to begin. Thankfully, however, no fight came. The ship was the Phoenix, the other vessel that accompanied Newport across the Atlantic. It had been lost in the fog as both ships neared the Chesapeake Bay in December. But instead of remaining on course, the Phoenix was battered by what sounds to the local Tidewater natives like a nor'easter. Francis Nelson, who captained the Phoenix, decided that he had to evacuate and sail back to the West Indies for safety. He wintered there while repairing and resupplying his storm-tossed crew before finally arriving in Jamestown on April 20th. Smith understood the magnitude of Nelson's arrival. Fresh provisions likely saved the colony from destruction before Newport returned for his second resupply mission. Nelson brought the remaining 40 new settlers who were immediately put to work. Nelson would remain in Virginia until June, waiting for Martin to conduct more gold tests. During that period, an interesting standoff occurred. Local Indians came to assist the English while planting crops. Soon, one of the Indians was found to have stolen English tools, and he was approached. The Indian then ran away while threatening any who followed. A few days passed, and two red-painted warriors paid a visit. They surrounded Smith and Scrivener, who then retreated into the fort for safety. But the Indians followed, and two others, already inside James Fort, joined the warriors. They demanded an Indian named Amicus, because they wanted to beat his brains out. At that point, Smith ordered the fort closed, the warriors arrested, and lookouts posted. He feared that this could be the beginning of an attack. On the next day, messengers were sent to demand the captured warriors' release. Smith replied that a release would happen only when the stolen tools were returned. But what Smith did not know at the time was that two of his own men were outside of the fort when he closed the gates. The Indians then captured them and now had a bargaining chip, but Smith wasn't willing to bargain. He headed a group of men up the James River, destroying anything that he could find. The plan must have worked, because the two English prisoners were released, whereupon one warrior was also freed. Smith kept the others captive in order to find out what the natives were up to. Using terrifying force, a confession was finally made. 
The Paspahegue and Chickahominy Indians were indeed planning an attack in order to seal all English tools. Smith's tactics made the Powhatans take notice. Soon Powhatans sent Pocahontas along with Rawhunt, his most trusted servant, to Jamestown. It seems that Pocahontas and the gifts that she brought quelled Smith's belligerence and peace was restored for the time being. Otherwise, while in Virginia, Nelson and Smith explored the Chesapeake Bay long enough to pacify John Ratcliffe's demand to find the South Sea, as well as find more gold. Nelson and Smith were against the idea, but Ratcliffe would not back down. So an expedition left long enough for Smith and Nelson to load the Phoenix with cedar wood, a real commodity, to take back to England. With the provisions finally doled out and the new commodities loaded onto the Phoenix, Nelson was ready to head back to England. Jamestown seemed to be on sound footing at this point, so it was reason that the often ill John Martin could be spared. Thus, he joined the return voyage, assuredly to Smith's enjoyment. Also because of the colony's newfound stability, John Smith decided to explore. Thus, when the Phoenix set sail on June 2, 1608, John Smith loaded 14 men onto a small barge and followed Nelson's exit before turning northward into the Chesapeake Bay. They landed at a point they named Cape Charles in honor of James' younger son. There, the Accomac Indians approached the strangers and demanded to know what they were there for. The two warriors then guided the English to the town of Accomac, where a pleasant engagement took place before the venture took to sea once again. Smith's venture quickly turned dangerous when he neared present-day Pocomoke City, Maryland. A storm rolled through the bay and greatly damaged the barge. As the men furiously bailed the sinking vessel out, they also had to steer to the closest dry land that they could find, which they humorously named Limbo upon arrival. They next managed to move toward the Nanticoke River before it became obvious that their shallop needed repairs. The men then began working to repair their barge when the Nanticoke Indians arrived. As with most Indian encounters up until this point, the English were met with arrows, had to repulse the attacks, and then friendly relations were established. This was the case when arrows flew at the stranded Englishmen one day, and then on the next day the Indians returned with baskets of bread. Smith believed this to be a trap, so he commanded his men to fire into the nearby reeds, where, sure enough, Nanticoke warriors hid, waiting to ambush the unsuspecting Englishmen. Smith and his men then followed the bloodshed by leaving their normal trinket offerings by a few Indian homes. After this skirmish, hundreds of Indians softened toward the strangers and began the best trading that John Smith had yet encountered in the region. Next, the expedition quickly moved northward while searching for the Massawomack tribe, but found nothing but forest and animals for miles. The monotony mixed with spoiling provisions eventually took a toll before too long because the men began complaining angrily. Smith, as he relates, apparently feared for his life, but stood up to the potential mutiny and told his crew to essentially stop being childish and act like men. A bold stance considering the circumstances, but the move worked. That is, until a fresh round of strong storms pummeled the explorers for the next three days. This time, four men fell extremely ill, which brought morale down low once again. Smith couldn't go on, and he had to about face. But Smith was somewhat disingenuous in his return. He instead kept exploring. The English sailed into the Potomac River where Wacomico Village was happened upon on June 16th. There they met Mosco, a strangely full-bearded native who escorted the English 30 miles up the Potomac River. Along the way, another tribe quickly descended upon the strangers, yelling hellish noises. During the cacophony, Smith kept his wits and ordered his men to fire into the woods, thus scaring the Indians more than they were frightening the English. After this encounter, the English continued sailing up this interesting river. They eventually found the Potomac tribe at their capital, where Moscow finally departed. Not staying too long with the Potomac people, the journey continued to the farthest point that Smith felt comfortable sailing, where they reached Nacoche Tank, a village on a hill overlooking what would become Washington, D.C. many years later. The English caught sight of something sparkly at Nacoche Tank, which seems to have immediately healed all illnesses, oddly enough. But as all other would-be gold discoveries, this sparkly dirt was still only dirt. The Potomacs capitalized on this English discovery, however, and told the strangers that there was a mine about seven or eight miles from their current location, near present-day Aquia, Virginia. Smith promptly marched there, but only found more dirt. 
He did, however, find what could be a potentially wealthy fur trade along the Potomac River. Finally, Smith began heading homeward. Along the way, the men would briefly stop at the mouth of the Rappahannock River where Smith did some fishing, but he didn't bring any fishing equipment on the journey. Instead, Smith jumped into the water attempting to catch one of the many fish he'd spotted. Instead, Smith jumped into the water attempting to catch one of the many fish he had spotted. He tried using his hands, then a frying pan. Finally, he attempted to skewer one with his sword. When Smith thrust into the water, however, it was as if his sword turned back into his own hand. A stingray barbed deep into Smith's hand, instantaneously sending the captain into writhing pain. The pain was so bad that Smith commanded his men to dig his grave and let him die. But the expedition's doctor, Dr. Russell, used his miracle potion to bring about healing. The potion worked, and Smith was still alive by the time a fish dinner rolled around at Stingray Point, the name given to the location. Eventually, after exploring more than 500 miles, the group arrived back at Jamestown on July 21st, and the colony was once again in dire straits. The July heat, as any Virginian today can attest, was unbearable. Add to that the contemporary heavy English dress, which amplified the heat's deadly effects. Many began falling ill, murmuring spread, and disarray followed. President Ratcliffe's leadership was brought into the crosshairs as he was criticized for his, quote, unreasonable, needless cruelty, as martial law was failing. The settlers dredged up a familiar complaint, namely that Ratcliffe, like Wingfield before him, was stealing from the storehouse, on top of that, Ratcliffe ordered the men to build him an extra special house, quote, for his pleasure in the woods. Smith used this to fan the flames by pitching in with the dissenters and called the new home Ratcliffe's Palace. Now was the time for Smith to shrewdly act. The settlers were angry, Ratcliffe was doomed, but who should take over next? Smith staked his claim by relating details of his recent mission, food, furs, other valuable commodities could all be had, even, potentially, precious metals. At least that's what he had seen along the way. The colonists soon began singing Smith's praises. Down with Ratcliffe, up with Smith. But instead of taking over directly, Smith set up a puppet ruler, his ally, Matthew Scrivener. Smith said that he wanted to keep exploring the Chesapeake Bay so he didn't have time to be tied down. He helped establish a new trustworthy council around Scrivener, who was at that time suffering from Virginia's July Inferno, and then left again for the Chesapeake Bay on July 24th. He was too quick in setting off on another journey. Seven of the explorers suffered illnesses as well, and effects were seen by the time the barge neared Point Comfort. After sailing into the bay, Smith had to think quickly once again when Massawomics and canoes were spotted and his men were too ill to withstand a sudden attack. He placed hats upon sticks to give the appearance of a large, healthy platoon, but in reality only a few men holding two guns each were manning the lookout. The ruse worked, and before long the English were sailing into the present-day Sassafras River, part of Maryland's eastern shore. There, another tribe, the Tokwogs, who were at war with the Massawomics, was engaged. They captivated Smith's attention because of the iron and brass tools they sported, they told Smith that the tools were acquired from the Susquehanna tribe along a great river in the north. Could this be the Northwest Passage? Smith reasoned that it wasn't. He felt that the description was about French-claimed lands and that the tools were somehow traded through tribes southward of the Chesapeake Bay. Either way, Smith attempted to move further northward, but when he came against what he called Smith's Falls on the Susquehanna River, he had to retrace his steps. They completed scouting the Chesapeake Bay by testing the Patuxent and Rappahannock Rivers for other potential Pacific outlets. The journey started out well enough with Moscow once again being made acquaintance, but after a while the situation turned dicey. The first people encountered were the Marotacans, who befriended the English. Moscow warned the English not to approach the next tribe, the Rappahannocks, because they would kill the English for befriending the Marotacans. Smith should have listened, but he didn't. Instead, the English sailed to the Rappahannocks and began establishing relations by sending Annis Toddkill to exchange hostages. Yet Moscow's warning was vindicated when Toddkill was waiting ashore. He spotted hundreds of warriors waiting to unload on him and the unsuspecting English. As he cried out, arrows began flying, and muskets replied. Amid the melee, Toddkill and his guide somehow stunningly made it back into the shallop, and Smith had to fortify the shallop in order to leave the scene. 
After adequately bolstering his defenses, Smith began to sail away, while Moscow was ashore trying to stay ahead of the Rappahannock warriors. At one section where the river narrowed and villages were seen, Moscow begged to be allowed on board. As soon as he was granted access, a shower of arrows slammed into the shallop as the English left. Eventually, the group returned to Jamestown on September 7th to mix news of mutiny, more illnesses, death, and failed crops. Now, amidst this scene, Smith felt it was time to take over. Scrivener had done what he could, but Smith reasoned that the situation was beyond his capabilities. The council agreed, and Smith replaced Ratcliffe, whose term was up on September 10th. John Smith had eluded death at least three times since leaving England, and now he was the president of the Virginia colony. No one could have predicted this stunning rise to power a year ago when Smith was to be hung. But how would Smith's presidency affect the Jamestown colony? More on that in the next podcast. Thank you for your continued support of the Virginia History Podcast. If you like what is being produced, please subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or Stitcher or your favorite podcast provider. Like us on Facebook and visit the website at vahistorypodcast.com. Please, also share the program as well as rating the podcast on iTunes and offering any feedback you may have. Thank you for those of you who have provided me with valuable comments. They are greatly appreciated. Join me next time as we begin looking into John Smith's leadership and how Jamestown was affected by it. Do 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 do